Hello, my little nerdlings. Uh, now we are reading The American Republic, Chapter 6, Section 3. Oh, we gotta go over the questions first, right? Questions. And the questions are Section quiz. Number one. What two victories virtually freed New Jersey from British occupation and gave new hope to Washington's men? Number two. Let's try not to knock this over. Number two. What American victory forced the British out of the North? Number three. Describe some of the Continental Army's struggles during the bad winter of 1777 and 1778. Four. What were privateers? What role did they play in the war for independence? Number five, who was the most famous American naval officer in the war for independence? And then the star, what did the, why did the British fail in their plan to cut off New England and Upper New York from the rest of the colonies? Because you don't mess with New England, baby! No, that's not the real reason. We'll figure it out when I read it. Da -da -da. Section three, okay. Three, battling for independence. Washington's action. The Americans assumed that New York would be the next British target. With Boston secured, Washington moved his army south to New York in April. But because of its sea access, islands, and rivers, New York proved impossible to defend. Throughout July, 700 British ships brought an army of 34,000 from Nova Scotia to New York. General William Howe was in command. Trouble in New York. Outnumbered four to one, Washington could not defeat the British, but he could outmaneuver them in battle. If he did not, he would lose his army. Howe had broken through the American outer defense in Long Island. This breach forced the Americans to flee to Brooklyn Heights by the East River. The Continental Army seemed to have no way of escape, but Alexander McDougall, one of Washington's aides, hurried across the East River to New York City and returned with a fleet of fishing boats, rowboats, and sailing ships. A rainy night followed by a heavy morning fog allowed the American army to be ferried to safety on Manhattan Island. After making a stand at the Battle of Harlem Heights on Manhattan Island, Washington managed to get most of his troops across the Hudson River to relative safety in New Jersey and then moved them to Pennsylvania. Over here on the other page, Nathan Hale, the schoolmaster who gave his life. In New York, Washington had a desperate need for information about British plans and troops on Long Island. When American officers were asked to volunteer for the dangerous task of spying on the British, there was only one volunteer. The volunteer was a school teacher from East Haddam, Connecticut, named Nathan Hale. Hale is considered the United States' first spy. Hale had no special training for such a mission. He did have his Yale diploma, however, which enabled him to travel as a schoolmaster. He was thus able to work his way south from Connecticut to Long Island in a few days. But Hale had no sooner gotten information about Long Island than Howe forced the Continental Army onto Manhattan Island. Because his information about Long Island would now be of less value, Hale pursued the British Army up Manhattan Island. There, on the night of September 21st, 1776, he was captured. The information he was carrying impl implicated him, and Howe ordered him to be hanged the next morning without a trial. On his way to the gallows, he supposedly said, I only regret that I have but one life to lose for my country. It is uncertain whether Hale said these words, but it is possible since they seem to be a paraphrase of some lines in Cato, an 18th century play. It is reasonable to assume that a schoolmaster of Hale's caliber could recall lines from the play. In any case, Captain Frederick Mackenzie, a British officer who described Hale's death, wrote, He behaved with great composure and resolution. Mackenzie added that Hale's last words were, It is the duty of every good officer to obey any orders given him by his commander-in-chief. Back to the regular chapter. Washington attacks Trenton and Princeton. Howe settled down in New York for the winter. He sent Hessian soldiers to Trenton, New Jersey, to keep an eye on Washington. The Americans had been forced out of New York and had not won a major battle in seven months. Their morale was low, and the troop enlistments would expire on December 31, 1776. 
If the men left when their enlistments expired, Washington would have only 1,400 men. Unless, of course, he gained some new recruits. He needed a victory to attract more men to the cause. Responding to the challenge, Washington and his men crossed the icy Delaware, uh, the icy Delaware River on Christmas night. They surprised the Hessians at Trenton the next morning and captured more than 900 of them. The British reacted quickly and sent a large force under Charles Cornwallis to confront Washington. Washington's men left decoy campfires burning, slipped out of camp and went around Cornwallis's camp. They marched north to Princeton, where they overcame a small British force. Washington then turned toward Morristown, the location selected for his winter headquarters. His daring, unconventional moves had freed most of New Jersey from British occupation and given new hope to the Americans. A British observer wrote, A few days ago, the Americans had given up the cause for lost. Now they are liberty, they are liberty mad again. <laughs> Pish posh. Victory at Saratoga. Because the British believed that a mere show of force might end the colonial rebellion, they had not been overly aggressive. In 1777, however, they developed a strategy that they thought would quickly end the war. According to the British plan, General John Burgoyne would lead an army south from Montreal to New York. General William Howe would move, no would move north up the Hudson River from New York City. General Barry saint Leger. Mm, saint Leger, uh, would go down to the St. Lawrence River from Montreal to Lake Ontario and then cut east across the Mohawk River Valley. <clears throat> the three generals were to, meet up at, were to meet at Albany. Their purpose was to cut off New England and Upper New York, centers of colonial resistance from the rest of the colonies. So let me read that again because I read it a little crooked. Their purpose was to cut off New England and Upper New York, centers of colonial resistance from the rest of the colonies. So everything was in, you know, all the power for the resistance was in New York and New England. In trying to execute their plan, the British made disastrous mistakes. Instead of moving up the Hudson, Howe decided to subdue Pennsylvania. He defeated Washington at Brandywine Creek, west of Philadelphia, and at Germantown. Howe then wintered in the luxury of Philadelphia and missed the action at Albany. saint Leger made some initial progress, but as he worked his way east, he found that the militiamen were tougher than he expected. saint Leger's force was made up of about 2,000 Indians and Tories, and the Indians were difficult to control. When Benedict Arnold's carefully planted rumors about American strength reached the ears of saint Leger's force, Many Indians deserted because Saint-Léger's force was crippled by the desertions and by an American attack. Saint-Léger retreated to Lake Ontario. Marching southward, Bourgogne recaptured Fort Ticonderoga on July 5th. From that point on, however, his progress was slowed. First, General Philip Schuyler's troops felled trees and dammed streams to block him. Soon, Bourgogne ran short of supplies and draft animals. He sent a foraging party of 700 men, mostly Hessians, east to Bennington, Vermont, where he had heard there was a stockpile of American military supplies. But his soldiers were met by a force of more than 1,500 New Hampshire militiamen under John Stark. These militiamen were angered by the shooting and scalping of Jane McRae, the finance... Oh my gosh, that's awful. These militiamen were angered by the shooting and scalping of Jane McRae, the fiancée of a loyalist soldier, and by Begonia's pardon of her murderer. The Patriots captured the foraging party and most of the relief party that was sent to rescue the British troops. Begonia needed to crush the Americans speedily or wait for rescue by Sir Henry Clinton, who was in, Amer uh, who was in New York City. On September 19th, Burgoyne attacked the Americans under Horatio Gates at Freeman's Farm near Saratoga. The British suffered heavy casualties. Thinking that Gates would divide his forces to go after Clinton, Burgoyne took the offensive a second time three weeks later at Bemis Heights. Again, he lost heavily. Low on supplies, he surrendered October 17th, 1777. The Battle of Saratoga took one British army out of the war and forced Britain to, to give up any hope of taking the northern colonies. 
Alarmed, the British changed their strategy. They would now focus on the South, where the population was more scattered and where there were more loyalists. Meanwhile, in the North, the British would continue the naval blockade and make coastal raids. The victory gave Americans a renewed hope. It also officially brought France into the war on the, on the American side. France hoped to weaken its greatest enemy, Great Britain, by aiding the Americans. French military and financial aid proved helpful as the war continued. Joseph Brandt, Mohawk Loyalist Joseph Brandt, a Mohawk chieftain, first gained recognition during the French and Indian War. He fought under Sir William Johnson, a British Indian agent, against the French. After the war, Johnson sent Brandt to Eliezer's... Eliezer... Eleazar's, wait a minute, hold on. Eleazar Wheelock's Indian School in Lebanon, Connecticut, where Brant became a devout Christian. During Pontiac's rebellion, Brant again fought with the British. Meanwhile, he was a missionary to his people. When the war for independence began, Brant sided with the loyalists. He thought that the colonies were wrong to rebel against the king, whom God placed in power. His influence brought many other Indians to the Loyalist cause as well. Commissioned a captain, he led several raids on American settlements in Cherry Valley, New York. The colonists soon feared his men. After the war, Brant urged peace. For his help during the war, the British gave his people money and land in Ontario. Brant returned to his missionary work and translated the Gospel of Mark into the Mohawk, Mohawk language. He never took up arms again. As an Indian statesman, he negotiated treaties with other tribes and traveled in the American West in an effort to form an all-Indian confederacy. Joseph Brandt was a man who gave his all to whatever cause he believed was right. Modern historians recognize him as a man of convictions and a devout Christian. I gotta have a drink. This is a long one. Okay. Setbacks of 1777 and 1778. Although victory helped America's cause, it did not improve the Continental Army's living conditions. Supply, bleh, supply problems left the soldiers hungry, cold, ill-clothed, and sick at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. In late 1777, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> in late 1777 and early 1778, Baron von Steuben a drill master from Prussia gave military training to those who were healthy. The pride and skill he instilled in them helped them focus on the cause ahead, uh, the cause instead of their hardships. A new army quartermaster, General Nathaniel Green, tried to solve the supply problem, but it hardly improved. Congress had no power to tax and little money for supplies. Supplies sent by the states rarely reached the men because of poor transportation or theft. An unstable paper money system also added to the crisis. The value of money rose or plunged depending on the outcome of battles. Some troops, some troops mutinied or demonstrated, and Pennsylvania troops marched off to the state house to negotiate their pay. The resources of the Continental Army were somewhat restored by donations. Robert Morris, head of the Department of Finance, asked for money and supplies from the states and for a loan of $4 million from France. Morris also used the banking system to stretch the government's resources. In June 1778, Sir Henry Clinton, who replaced Howe in the North, moved from Philadelphia. He hoped to use the New York Harbor as a base for sea raids. Washington followed him and attacked at Monmouth Courthouse in New Jersey. The American effort was unsuccessful and the British made it to New York. Washington and his men spent the winter of 1778-1779 at White Plains, New York, hoping at least to keep Clinton in the area. The War in the West The British, Loyalists, and Indians were also active in the West. In 1778, settlers in the Wyoming Valley of Pennsylvania and the Cherry Valley of New York were massacred. In response, American General John Sullivan drove the Tories back to their base at Fort Niagara, but he never gained the fort itself. The British also raided settlements in the Ohio Valley. Colonel Henry Hamilton, nicknamed Hair Buyer because he paid bounties for American scalps, was responsible. George Rogers Clark organized a force of 175 men to go into the Ohio Valley to drive Hamilton out. 
braving dark forests, swamps, and icy rivers, as well as the threat of Indians and Tories, Clark captured two frontier outposts. Uh, Kaskaskia in Illinois and Vincennes in Indiana. These captures later allowed the United States to claim lands bordering the Mississippi River, the war at sea. Throughout the war, America was involved in fighting at sea. America did not have a navy at the beginning of the war. The early navy consisted mostly of privateers, merchant vessels outfitted to fight. That would be like lobster boats around here with artillery on them. That'd be kind of cool, actually. Um, since Great Britain had a strong navy, Americans faced an almost impossible task on the seas. After France came into the war, the Americans hoped that French sea power would come to their aid. America used French ports as bases of operation and even used French ships to attack the British. The most famous American naval officer was John Paul Jones, a Scotsman by birth. Jones gained his greatest fame by defeating the British ship Serapis. 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 Okay. I did not know the name of the boat. In the North Sea. Serapis in the North Sea. He used a French ship rechristened the Bonhomme Richard after Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac. Yeah, Bonhomme means a poor guy. And Richard is Richard. Anyway, so we got the other portion here, Women at War for Independence. Hi, Vinny. Don't walk over here. He just got out of the shower. Thank God he doesn't stink anymore. Just kidding. He doesn't stink anymore. Women at War for Independence. <clears throat> Several women contributed to the Patriot cause on the field of battle. Some helped in a moment of crisis. Others fought throughout the struggle. From the front lines to the frontier, these women took the call to arms seriously. They were not afraid to fight for the cause their families and friends believed in, no matter what the cost. Margaret Corbin went to war with her husband. During the British attack on Fort Washington in New York, she began firing a cannon when the men firing it was killed when the man firing it was killed. When her husband, who was firing the cannon next to her, was killed, Margaret took position oh my gosh, Margaret took over his position and continued firing until she was shot and wounded. Her wound was so severe that she was an invalid for the rest of her life. Whoa, that is tough. Mary Ludwig Hayes Macaulay was a warrior who became known as Molly Pitcher. She served as a water carrier for her, her husband and other Patriot soldiers during the Battle of Monmouth, which took place on a hot day in late June. When her husband was wounded, Mary took charge of his cannon and fired the weapon for him. Betty Zane helped the Patriots during an Indian and Loyalist attack in, on Fort Henry in Western Virginia. The Patriot defenders found themselves running low on gunpowder. They knew that some was available in a cabin about 100 yards away. To go after the power, powder seemed suicidal, but Betty convinced the men that she could make it. She reasoned that since she was a woman, the Indians might be more interested in capturing her than shooting her. Leaving the stockade, Betty calmly walked across the line of fire to the cabin. There she put the powder into a tablecloth and headed back. On her return trip, the Indians and loyalists saw what she was doing and began firing at her. Running all the way, she arrived safely at the fort. Those are some tough women. Anne, Mad Ann Bailey, was an adventurous woman who was a scout and a messenger for the Patriots, for the Patriots on the western frontier of present-day Ohio, Virginia, and West Virginia. She was given her nickname by the Indians because they thought she either had special protection from the Great Spirit or she was insane. Could have been a little of both. Her husband had been killed in an Indian attack in 1774. Once, when, she chased, when chased by Indians, she hid in a hollow log. After the Indians left, she trailed them to their camp and that night took back everything they had stolen from her. Several times, she traveled alone through areas controlled by Indians to get gunpowder for a fort that was running low. Nancy Hart also helped the Patriots. The Indians fighting for the British in Georgia called her the War Woman. Once, she helped a Patriot escape from several Loyalists by having him gallop through her house so that he would not leave a trail. 
When the loyalists return from their futile search, they force Nancy to prepare a meal for them. While doing so, she sent her daughter for help. Then, while the, while the loyalists were eating, she took their muskets, killed two of the men, and held the rest at gunpoint until help, to, help arrived. So, yeah, the lesson of that story is don't mess with those women in the 1700s. Uh, Songs of the War. Oh, boy, I'm not singing this. During the War for Independence, both the British and the Americans wrote poems about themselves and their enemies and set them to popular tunes. Sometimes the Americans changed the words of British songs. Yankee Doodle, the most famous song of the War for Independence, was originally a British song that made fun of the colonists. <clears throat> Yankee Doodle came to town for to buy a firelock. We will tar and feather him and so we will John Hancock. Yeah, that's not cool. So we Americans changed it over. The Americans changed the song's lyrics to familiar words we know today. The British probably disliked the fact that their song was used to insult them instead. Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Fa Father and I went down to camp along with Captain Gooding. There we saw the men and boys as thick as hasty pudding. Hasty pudding is actually kind of gross. There was Captain Washington upon a slapping stallion, giving orders to his men. I guess there was a million. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. Yankee Doodle, dandy. Mind the music and the step and with the girls be handy. Don't be handy with the girls. That's not nice. Uh, yeah, and that's it. That's the end of chapter or section three. So there you go, fellas and ladies. We'll see you next time.